Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. I am pleased to welcome you to the York University Public Lecture Series of the Faculty of Education tonight. What would be a better occasion to talk about quality education, education for a sustainable future, global citizenship, than the globally and nationally recognized SDG Awareness Week, a collaboration of higher education to promote the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or short SDGs. You're not quite sure yet what that exactly is and how that applies to you and education in general? You're in the right place to learn more tonight. A special welcome to our current and former students. Many teachers are joining us tonight from the Toronto, from the Peel, Hall, New York District School Boards, and also from other school boards and other institutions throughout Ontario, Canada, and internationally. Thank you everyone for joining, and our special appreciation goes to those who are spending their off hours, their evening, or even stayed up during the night. Hello, Europeans. <laughs> Thanks to your families, for letting you go and giving up their time so you can be with us tonight. My name is Catherine Cole and I'm the coordinator of York University's UNESCO Chair. It is my pleasure to moderate tonight's event. Before we begin, I'd like to share a couple of housekeeping reminders. Please be a and please note that this lecture is being recorded to be posted for the purposes of this program and will be made available afterwards for those who might not be able to attend tonight. It is also being simulcast by a voice at radio and closed captioning is available. If you have any questions or comments, you can post them in the Q&A section of the Zoom webinar function at any point in time. For those of you who might not be familiar with our tradition or those who are joining us from outside of Canada, at the beginning of a gathering, may it be in person or may it be virtual, we pay tribute to the caretakers of the lands that we are on. Therefore, I would like to start off tonight's virtual lecture with a land acknowledgement. As this event is virtual and we are not all gathered in the same space, I recognize that this land acknowledgement might not be for the territory that you are currently on. I would like to ask that if this is the case, you take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory that you are on and its current treaty holders. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University's campuses are located today. I acknowledge my presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Toronto has been caretaken by the Ashnabic nations, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Yurnwendat. It is now home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities. I acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wambut Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. It is now my pleasure to share the stage with our Dean of the Faculty of Education, Dr. Rob Savage, for his welcoming remarks. Rob joined York University in July 2021. Before that, he was head of department at University College London at the Institute of Education. And prior to that, he was a William Dawson Scholar at McGill University in Montreal. He has published over 120 book chapters, reviews, and research articles in leading journals in his field. He's a school-based psychologist and classroom teacher by training and from these applied experiences maintains an interest in making schools effective learning places for all children. Thank you, Rob, for sharing your remarks. Good evening. I'm Robert Savage, the Dean of the Faculty of Education here at York University, and it is my pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to everyone Thank you for joining us this evening for the third event in our public lecture series entitled Educating Tomorrow's Un Unknowns, Sustainability Front and Centre. 
The talk will be delivered by Charles Hopkins, who holds the UNESCO Chair in Reorienting Education Towards Sustainability here at York University. This chair, established in 1999, was the first one in the world to focus on Education for Sustainable Development, ESD, as an overarching concept and positioning sustainability as a purpose of education. Today, Hopkins coordinates two global ESD research networks, the International Network of Teacher Education Institutions and the Indigenous ESD. The first network is comprised of teacher education institutions spanning some 50 countries and focusing on enhancing ESD in pre-service and in-service teacher development. The second network covering 40 countries aims to embed ESD in curricula to improve the educational outcomes of Indigenous youth. Internationally, Hopkins has a long relationship with education and sustainability, chairing the writing and adoption processes of several UNESCO ESD declarations. An awarded educational leader with several honorary doctorates and professorships, Hopkins has lectured and presented papers in approximately 75 countries. He is also the co-director of the Asia Pacific Institute on ESD in Beijing, China. York University is internationally recognised for its commitment and contributions to addressing the SDGs. This is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, through teaching, research, stewardship and partnership, as outlined in the university-wide academic plan, which serves as a blueprint for action. York offers some 1600 courses, including some here in the Faculty of Education, related to at least one of the SDGs, and funds groundbreaking research to advance York's contribution to the SDGs. York University was also ranked as one of the world's top 35 universities in impact for sustainable development. The renowned 2022 Times Higher Education Impact Ranking places York third in Canada and ninth in the world for SDG 16, Peace, Justice and Strong Institutions, and first in Canada and 21st in the world for SDG 5, gender equality, demonstrating York's commitment to being an agent of positive change in a world facing a range of issues, including climate change, recovery from global pandemic poverty, systemic inequality and political polarization. This is a timely connection. Tomorrow is International Women's Day. Tonight, Charles will share insights into how we can use ESD to achieve more sustainable futures for all. Charles asks us challenging questions relevant to all, how can we understand global issues and the interconnectedness? How can we learn to live sustainably and ethically without the feeling of only giving up or cutting back? What does this mean for educators, parents and students? Are we to add more content to an already overcrowded curriculum? Charles Hopkins' presentation speaks not to the role of climate scientists and governments, but instead to the vital role of education in sustainability and of concrete ways for educators at all levels education professionals, students and parents to understand the needs to become engaged participants and make the differences we all need. Thank you very much, Rob, for your kind words. Uh, Rob is currently traveling, but took the time to record his remarks for us tonight. Thank you very much for that. And now, other than encouraging the audience to leave your comments and questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom webinar, I would like to hand it over to tonight's speaker, our UNESCO chair, Charles Hopkins. And whenever you're ready, I'd like to say the floor is yours. Thanks, Charles. Uh, <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, first of all, let me begin by thanking our Dean, Rob Savage, for the kind introduction, and uh, also, of course, for inviting me to be part of this lecture series. And uh, thank you, Catherine, for your work moderating this evening, and my thanks to Alicia and Anderson for helping us to prepare for this event. Uh, it's, it's interesting and appropriate that this evening's lecture is part of York celebrations of SDG Awareness Week, as our lecture tonight highlights SDG 4 on education. SDG 4 strives to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and to promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. Quite lofty, um, but it is certainly something that is needed. 
Now, the, the awareness of the SDGs ad addressing global issues like climate change and other complex social, environmental and, and economic injustices is certainly on the rise. I, mean, uh, I think uh, many of you have seen the little pins, right? And uh, we have uh, from Germany, um, SDG Ruby Cube and so on. And uh, my favorite, uh, I was presented in China at a high school with SDG soccer ball, and so on, which I, I thought was really, uh, really nice. But beyond awareness being on the rise, the important thing is the world is all really increasingly taking action, not only uh, on, on the global level, uh, but equally importantly, at the, the local and, and the, the community level. As well, the, the world's education systems are themselves playing increasing roles in addressing these, these global crises. Now, this evening, I want to explore the importance of education at, at all levels, right? engaging and preparing students to thrive in this anticipated and unknown future, but one that many have the perception that we were going to have to give up many of the standards of living that we've come to treasure and, and, and to, of course, enjoy. But for educators, it's how, how can we best prepare for the future uh, that is really often now perceived with unease and, and dread, and uh, rather than you know, hopeful anticipation. Now, for 30 years, education uh, has been perceived as crucial in achieving a more sustainable future. And, and tonight, I want to explore the past, uh, the present, and, and delve into the future of, of that story. So let me begin by putting up uh, some slides that I've prepared uh, just to help me go in getting along with that story. The one, one expectation or, or hope of parents is uh, for education to help prepare students for the future. Mm -hmm. and, but how can we anticipate the world into which they are going to graduate when things are changing so very, very rapidly? Now, each year, the World Economic Forum surveys globally to find um, the perceived global sustainability risks. And this year, they've released these findings that give us insight in, into aspects that our future children and, and students will likely inherit. And uh, here is a chart that I would like to share with you uh, with this year's report that has uh, just been released. Now, if we we see the chart is divided in, in two. Now, on the left, it talks about what are the, the perceptions that, that people have as to what are the sustainability risks two years out, now and up to two years. And on the, the other chart, it talks about the ones that are will be more uh, like 10 years out when our students will be graduating or, or moving in. Now, just for the, the color code, the um, the environmental ones are green, the uh, the red are social issues, the purples are technological issues, and geopolitical being orange. Now, for those who are on the radio, let me just describe a, a moment. Two years out, it seems as though the big issue is the cost of living and a poverty striking, uh, the collapse, uh, loss of housing, that sort of thing. But the, the second big thing now is natural disasters. This is an environmental kind of issue where the first one was a social economic issue. The third one is uh, geoeconomic confrontations and uh, which is much more of a geopolitical aspect. Climate change, 
it's already affecting us. It's on, and this is an environmental issue. And of course, the fifth one is the erosion of social cohesion. So these are the big issues that are, are out there now. But 10 years out on the horizon, let's say the, the big issues appear the first four of the, the 10 are all environmental. The, the fifth one, is a social issue. But the first, the, the top issues that are, seem to be coming, the first one is our failure to mitigate or reduce the impact of climate change. And the second one is our failure to adapt to climate change. The third being natural disasters. The fourth being biodiversity loss as we, and every year things are, are getting much worse. And the fifth one is large-scale involuntary migration. Right? So these are the, the kinds of issues that are out there. And we, of course, wonder, what is there a role for education right? in, in preparing people and anticipation of the kind of world they're going out there? And I, I would like to make some comments on that as, as we go through. Now, the big scheme that, of course, uh, we're all pretty aware of, the way in which the world is trying to work together, collaborative, in an overarching model to, to move forward, is what we've come up with is sustainable development. It, it was the best that we could come up with when in the 1980s we could see there was a clash between the development, the race to address the abject poverty, especially in, in the colonies that had been abandoned and were now called developing countries. Right? So the need to address poverty and, and the hard um, situations they were in, but at the same time, look at the environmental integrity and the ability of the planet. And so uh, after two years of traveling the world, the Prime Minister of Norway, Gro Harlan Brundtland, with a commission, traveled the world. I, I had the privilege of presenting to them in Ottawa in 1986. But in 1987, they came back with their idea of, okay, yes, we must have development, but let's make it sustainable. Right? Let's make the development whatever it is. And so the, the concept that would could be agreed upon by the, the world leaders was the, the definition from Brundtland was a development that that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to be able to meet their own needs as well. Kind of complex, but I like the idea of the definition of an African elder that I heard in 2002 in Johannesburg. His definition was simple. It was enough for all forever enough for all forever and the the whole concept you can have that discussion with anybody of any age what is enough right? and being indigenous when he said for all he was not just talking about his tribe or the people of south africa or people right he was talking about all living beings and then the intergenerational responsibility in the word forever now, in a northern context, I think that uh, enough kind of things of things or of stuff. And so I would much rather go along with the concept of well-being for all forever. And where well-being is not simply well off, right? Uh, I may have time to come back and talk a little bit more about this whole thing of, of well-being that we're pursuing. Now, this is a long journey, and I just wanted to uh, briefly put things in perspective as we're trying to look at the SDG uh, Awareness Week First, and the role of education that has strung right through it. So if we look at, at the, in the very beginning, where we're trying to look at global collaboration, the formation of the United Nations, one of the very first agencies or organizations that they created in Paris was UNESCO, the United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization, for it was believed that war was created in the minds of men, and therefore it was in the minds of men that it must be perceived to, and to prevent it. 
But in 1987, after uh, two years of traveling the world, and we came back with with the acceptance in Japan of the of the uh, uh, well, it was a global meeting in Japan of the concept of sustainable development. And then for the next five years, it's one thing I agree. Oh yeah, we'll have sustainable development, but what are we going to do, right? So for the next five years, there were tremendous negotiations going all around the world as to come up with an implementation plan. The plan that was agreed upon in 1992 in Rio is called Agenda 21, or the agenda for the 21st century. 40 chapters, and one of them, I had again the, the pleasure of being one of the 10 authors, was on education, public awareness, and training which we perceived and was, adapt, was the only one that was adopted at, at, at Rio with really almost no discussion. It was unanimous. Yes, we, we have to have that. Interestingly enough, at the same time at Rio, there were four conventions. The one that everyone knows about is the Convention on Climate Change or COP, right? And that uh, was a parallel process that keeps, uh, keeps going on. There is another COP on biodiversity and one on desertification and another one on forestries, but these are separate and moving along. Now, with the, the turn of the, the millennium, uh, we come up with a second, uh, a sequel implementation plan to rejuvenate things. And to, we moved from 40 topics down to eight. And this, these were the millennium development goals, and they were to run for 15 years. And so they did, but education again was a key, one of the eight. Now, in getting ready, because we knew that the first negotiations were five years from 87 to 92, they started the negotiations again in 2012 with a program called The World We Want. And countries all around the world, there were hundreds of thousands of discussions and, and suggestions came in that were gradually boiled down and became what was known now as agenda, the 2030 Agenda. And at the heart of that are the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So that's just the sequel. And in 20, th these will run for 15 years to uh, until 2030. But probably in three or four years, we'll start the negotiations again for what will go from 2030, likely to uh, 2050. Just some tweaks or changes from those eight millennium development goals up to 17. They're organized in the, what we call the five Ps. The, those used to be, remember, the social, environmental, and economic. Well, the social became people, uh, economic became prosperity, and uh, of course, the environment became planet. But to that, two important things. One is the quest for peace. Right. How do we bring peace into this? And not just peace at the international level, we realize that we need peace at the local, the community, and within the inner person bringing peace. Yeah. And as well, we realize that this isn't something just for countries right, to negotiate and so on as part of trade packages. No, this is something that we all must get involved in. The other big thing that was different is that this is for all countries, not just the least developing countries. So the idea of bringing in the private sector, academia, and, and uh, faith-based groups, uh, all of these all have a role to play. The one thing about the sustainable, the, the 17 goals, the 17th one being partnership, is the idea that while they have individual titles, they really are to be seen as interwoven, a complex, they, they all work in, uh, with one another. Uh, you have to think of, a, I, lo I love the, the idea of a, a quilt, a patchwork quilt. So one patch, yes, but really you want the whole quilt to be working. Right? So if we look at each of the goals in a little more depth, so this sustainable development goal four, you'll see that each goal has targets and the targets also have indicators and so on. Now the targets for education in a sustainability context, 
there, the, there are seven, but the first six are sort of what we're already working on, what we're already doing. So pretty well everyone is engaged in working on the sustainable development goals. That first uh, target of complete free quality primary and secondary education. But where we need the discussion is what constitutes quality. And does that vary from society to society, from country to country? And that's why every country, and in our case, every province, has control sort of over its, its own education. The second one being access to early childhood uh, care. And uh, uh, the fourth, skills for employment and entrepreneurship. But what is different is the seventh one where it is highlighted that everyone must have knowledge and skills for sustainable development. Now, each of these uh, targets are fleshed out. So if we look at target 4.7, it states that by 2030, ensure all learners acquire knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development. That's meaning implement it, right? Including through education for sustainable development. And then it talks about sustainable life. And, and it also highlights global citizenship education. So that's really what I, I now want to uh, talk a little bit more about it. So, but the, what is really interesting is just as at, at Rio in 1992, where education not only had its own chapter, but was embedded across all 40 chapters, in, sometimes not the word education, but it would be understanding, knowledge, research, etc. ESD on three occasions at the United Nations General Assembly in 2017, 19, again in 21, has been stated as the key enabler of all the sustainable development goals. All of the goals have a, have a, 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 a component within it. So if we look at what really is education for, uh, for sustainable development, we have <clears throat> four things. I said when we were trying, to, uh, the 10 of us, were, we met several times uh, in that negotiation period from 87 to 92, trying to look at what was, what was really needed. And a story that will, I'll never get out of my mind, one of, the, uh, of us was the president of Princeton University, and he was making the point that really what we, what we desperately needed was better understanding of recycling, the knowledge, the skills and, and for recycling. And the dean of the Faculty of Education, the University of Cairo, he said, I have several hundred thousand children living in the dumps of Cairo who are excellent at recycling. What they really need is an education. And that really shifted our whole perspective. And we started uh, really thinking about it. And, and so we came up with four big areas to work on. And that first one was recognizing that everyone must have an education. We needed education. Once uh, uh, the average education within a country gets above grade four, population starts to come down. There, there's so much in the complexity of just access and retention in quality education. But we also acknowledge that it was our most educated countries that were also creating some of the deepest ecological footprints and creating some of the, the greatest threats to a sustainable future. And so what we came up with was the, the second one was reorienting the purpose of education as it was now, reorienting from development to sustainable development, tall order. And that's really what we're trying to work at now. The third one was recognizing we had to have the support of the general public. We needed public awareness and public understanding. We needed knowledgeable um, citizens practicing knowledge uh, and knowledgeable consumers. We there was just so much that we had to have in in the, in the general public. 
And the fourth one was where we do know how to do things better. Let's share the training and, and, uh, and moving forward. So those are, are sort of the elements. But then when we start thinking about global citizenship, this wasn't the idea of creating social cohesion. It, it, it was building solidarity, concern for the, for the other, creating the sense of belonging and that, uh, that needed to be there. It, understanding the social and cultural interdependency that, that parallel the interconnected interdependency of nature but of, of humanity itself and, and we wanted to make it very clear that we're not giving up our canadian citizenship or, or anything of that nature no it, it, it's a way of, of thinking about others it, and I love to think it's it's not gaining a whole group of rights, but it's assuming a number of of responsibilities, especially for others, right? So what we're doing is putting the two of them together. So on uh, the education for sustainable development, really looking at knowledge and skills and understanding how the world works, etc. Looking at it largely. Um, from the uh, the natural and physical sciences and so on and building that in together with global citizenship education that is more about creating uh, coming from the social sciences the creating of oneness and and so on but also a second part of it giving people the skills to actually participate as a knowledgeable citizen right? How do, where do we get information? How do we process this? Does it make sense? And so on. The skills to, to, to influence people, to present your ideas, to become engaged in conversation. So you can see bringing the two of them together, you have the head of, of the ESD, but you have the, the, the heart and the hands of global citizenship working uh, working together. So this is sort of the challenge that we're trying to work at. But all of this is is a huge call. I mean, we're, we're now in, in th these discussions at, at the international and, and local level, we're, we're trying, it's calling really for transformation. Transformation on two levels. One, the transformation of the learner. Right? The second being the transformation of our education systems at, at, at all at, at all levels. It's interesting. They're proposing uh, UNESCO is proposing, uh, and uh, not only UNESCO but OECD, uh, you know, sort of the corporate aspect, are looking at at these stages. The, the first one, making sure that it is built on knowledge and information, right? Where do we get that? The, the, the true uh, un understanding. The second thing, though, is the critical analysis of, of the of the idea. Why is it the way it is? Who is benefiting from it? Why does it perpetuate? What could change that would solve the issue? What new problems would the the, uh, the solution bring that, that that kind of deep critical thinking and you can see that's what our, our education systems already are, are calling for the third one though is how do you build that social cohesion and, and it's with exposure engagement involvement that, that hands-on bit and then the the next one is is going beyond empathy, actually building compassion. The more you know about either somebody or something, some issue or whatever, you build the relationship so that then in the fifth stage you act. Okay? It's moving on with knowledgeable uh, action and, and, and taking forward. So th these are really interesting components that, uh, that are emerging at the time. Now, the system at the at the top levels are actually buying into it. And um, Canada, uh, uh, you know, can't, can affect higher education. But at, at the Canadian level, the Council of Ministers of Education, the, uh, uh, CMAC, 
have worked collaboratively across the provinces to come up with what we call transferable skills from grades one to 12. And there again, you have the critical thinking, problem solving, self-directed learning, and so on. But they also identify global citizenship and sustainability as one of the key transferable skills to bring in. Ontario Ministry of Education have adopted this, and that is to be embedded in across the uh, the curriculum as well. The um, uh, uh, EQAO in their writings and so on have put it there, and now the deans, uh, the the Association of Canadian Deans of Education, their statement is we. We recognize that our actions as faculties, colleges, schools, and departments of education are complicit in this critical trajectory. We have a responsibility and an opportunity to make a difference. So the wording, of course, uh, the wording is out there. But, of course, <laughs> yes, <laughs> our teachers ready. Right? What is what has been put in to, to building now we always have the early adopters we've had teachers who are out there and i, I would assume most of you who are tuning in there tonight are, you're you're in that group of, of, of out at the front end the point end of the stick right but globally unesco uh, working with the uh, like the uh, education international which is like the global teacher union uh, it held this big survey, 58,000 uh, students or, or teachers from around the world. And they found that fewer than 40% of teachers surveyed that are confident, for instance, in teaching about climate change, just don't, don't have it yet. But 95% of uh, teachers believe that it's important or very important to teach uh, this. And over 80% wanted continuing learning uh, uh, to help them forward. The survey found that mostly how this was taught, whether they were the green ones of, of education for sustainable development, that is climate change and sustainable production and consumption, or they were more related to global citizenship education around human rights, gender equity, and uh, or cultural diversity and, and toleration. And they found that most of what was taught was the cognitive aspects, you know, sort of the facts and, and kind of shied away from behavior or socio-emotional aspects of teaching it. And they also found they had a difficult, uh, the, the teachers said they didn't see it in the curriculum, not, not maybe in, in the preface but not outlined really there in the curriculum. And they also pointed out how difficult it, it really was for assessment. You know, when do you assess at the end of the week, end of the year, later in life, it, all, all of these kinds of aspects. The second thing beyond not, the teachers not being prepared is the whole thing about uh, the crowded curriculum. You know, where do we shoehorn this in? When I was a superintendent of, of uh, curriculum with the Toronto Board of Education, every, every two weeks, there would be a group, an NGO, uh, some parents, uh, even the private sector, whatever, would come walking into my office with a binder and say, would you just put this into the, into the curriculum? Now, on the one hand, they say, you've got 14 years, surely you can take, you know, but, this, the whole concept of all of the things, we call them adjectival educations. You know, it just points out how inadequate, because if you look at them, they're all important. They're all useful. And it shows that just drilling on the basics and the core disciplines does not really prepare someone for life. Right? So, we, uh, in, in trying to come up with what are we going to call this in, in uh, the years after 92, the next two years, I, I spent a fair bit of time in the house of UNESCO helping and, and uh, it was fascinating 
as to what we were going to call it, because in the beginning, we were just thinking about teaching about sustainable development, but we quickly came to the idea that it wasn't just about, we didn't have time for that. We want to teach for, all education is with purpose. So we head on, this is our education systems, a, a teaching for a sustainable future. Right? And so we did not want to call it sustainability education where it'd be lost in this group of 100. So it's called education for sustainable development. And it's applicable, of course, at, at every, uh, every grade level. Now, as well, the third big deterrent that as I traveled around meeting with ministers of education in different countries around the world in the work of my UNESCO chair, they would all say, oh, this is very important. It's very nice, but we're focusing on our PISA score. Now, for the parents who are out there, PISA is a pro program for international student assessments conducted by the Organization for Economic Cooperation. Um, and 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 development, but it 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 really it tests countries on uh, math, language, sometimes science. That's what the newspapers report. It goes deep in that, but it's always where do we stand? Canada does it does very very well, and uh, up there. And the same with EQAO, the, you know, the quality assessment uh, of, uh, and again, it's reading math and, 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 uh, and language skills in, in general. Now, these are skills. These are our tools. They're extremely important, okay? but they're not the purpose of education. Okay? We have to look at them. These are the skills. But they also need to know information from, from the adjectival. Right? But the purpose, what we're trying to do, is a way of embedding uh, ESD and global citizenship into the curriculum right? as a purpose, overarching purpose of education. Now, in the research that we carried out in 18 countries around the world, we found that using, embedding ESD and GCED were wonderful ways of not only sharpening the tools, but giving the, the students a way of using them. So how do we build in math, language, and so on into the, uh, the real operations? Now, we're not trying to change. I think it's very, also very important that the change is not all that profound. Okay? If we look at the top part, we're still saying that sort of the overall intent of education, you know, is starting off with just having people enjoying learning. Right? And then from there, exploring what to learn, what all is out there. And so on, and then learning how to learn about what you want to learn and then learning for purpose. The next step, however, though, is one that we don't do very well, and that's shifting the responsibility of learning from the teacher to the student. Right? How do we get our students to assume responsibility for their future? Not only their own, their future learning, but all aspects, but how learning fits into that. And then from there into the whole concept of lifelong learning. Now, in looking at what UNESCO does is about every 25 years or so, they look at what is the purpose of education and they bring together some brilliant minds and they say, okay, what has changed in the last 25 years? So how, what should change in, in education? And we're going through one of those changes now. The, the previous one came out of the Dolores Report, uh, Learning the Treasure Within, it was called. And uh, <clears throat> but I, I hope to, just as an aside, I, I want to give, uh, we'll give you some links as to where you can find some of these things that I'm referring to. And we'll send those out tomorrow and in, in, in the near future. But the Dolores Report, in 1996, they, they said there are four basic things in, in uh, purpose of education. One purpose is to learning to know. 
And, and of course, that covers all kinds of, of uh, content and, and, and the cognitive aspects and so on. He also said another one was learning to do, sort of the skills uh, and aptitudes kind of thing. The third one was learning to be, to be all one can. And the fourth was learning to live together. Now, over these years, we're now and in the context of the SDGs. In 2015, when they when this was brought forward, we started rethinking. And so the learning to know, we supplemented into that the, the awareness of what we don't know, the kinds of things that we're doing in the world where we really don't know the outcomes. And so that should be taken into consideration, just like in to do, doing things ethically. Right? And, and the whole thing to be is not just about you being, right? but to ensure equity for others to be as well, to move from ed to education towards uh, a, a, a social responsibility. And then the idea of to live together, to live together with others in the context of the African elder or others, yes, other cultures, other perspectives, other, but all life, right? And to do it sustainably. Now, we're, UNESCO is in the middle of coming out again with, uh, with this uh, exploration, the purpose of education, and ask, asking huge questions. And you can become a part of, of all of this. This uh, uh, learning to become is a, a document to uh, brought forward uh, where they look at it as learning as a social contract. Very, very, and then transforming education and, and learning how to transform, to question whose knowledge. You know, it, 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 what is the role of traditional uh, ecological knowledge and, and so on? So all of this now, and I'm, I'm trying to, to whip up fairly, fairly quickly. I wanted to talk a little bit about in, in uh, engaging uh, with youth, because oftentimes students don't get much practice to be a citizen. Okay. Suddenly they graduate, and now you're a citizen and assuming it all. But there's 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 no gradual practice, time to think, and so on. And so it's how do we bring forward a, a knowledgeable student voice to develop this responsible citizenship? How and, and a, a real part of education it is discussing controversial issues, learning the skills of, of, uh, of engaging in topics that are really relevant to their life, to deepen their understanding of the complexity of, of most issues, to, to listen to diverse perspectives, to measure them, to consider and think about them, share ideas, listen to their to their peers, and, and practice being open and, and respectful and so on. But also to go beyond that, uh, to actually in move to to engage the students sometimes in 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 action. This is really huge in in uh, in Europe at uh, at the, at the moment. But of course, one has to to look at it carefully. Is it age approach, uh, appropriate? You know, uh, is, it, is it really education or is it indoctrination? That's not where where we're trying to go. We're trying to learn from the journey, and sometimes uh, young people have brilliant ideas. Uh, let me tell you a quick story. The handprint that is uh, on on the left is a story I'm so so pleased with. In 2004, in Hyderabad, in India, a teacher was teaching about our ecological footprint. I think everyone sort of knows that. 
And the, the teacher had uh, four balloons representing the four Earths we would need if everyone in India lived like we need to live in North America and so on. And a little girl <clears throat> said, but I have hands. I can do something about my footprints. And the teacher saw the power of that analogy. She went to the Center for Environmental Education, a large NGO in, in India, talked to them. They too recognized it and went on to the Ministry of Environment, India, and it is spread not only throughout India, Africa, it is, goes through Europe and in and, and many places in North America. Now we talk about the ecological handprint. The power of it is the hope. We all have footprints. Everything we do has a footprint. But there is a way in which we can both uh, uh, reduce our footprint and enlarge our handprint. So if you're a university student and you're, you're taking part in foreign exchange or, or, or foreign studies, foreign travel and so on, yes, your flight will have a footprint. But the learning and what comes out of that in the rest of your life, make sure that the handprint makes it, uh, is there and avoid. Sometimes it's, it's just a, a, a simple little thing of, of, of uh, in, engaging, you know, the, the idea of putting a controversial picture out or just having, having the students discuss this. Uh, the, the idea of the pursuit of well-being, you know, the, the importance of being able to cope with where you were born, your physical features, being able to cope with the, 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 your station in life. And so on. That, that's one aspect beyond the Maslowian needs you need to, for well-being. But on top of that, how you are in the, your preparation for the world of work. How well you get along with colleagues, with other people? Is there meaningfulness in your life? All of these kinds of aspects of well-being that go beyond that whole idea of, uh, of simply being well off. Now, one of the big things we try to do is, is making it relevant. How do we bring these global goals into a local context. So if we look at the environmental or now the, the planet aspects and start looking at housing, transportation, waste, and so on, uh, and sewage treatment, or if, if we look at the social aspects, which we now call people, right? It, issues around exclusion, um, access, equity, th those kinds of, of social, there, there are many of that the students would put their own sort of twist to it. And there are economic ones, the, the prosperity ones of, of, of poverty, uh, of uh, how can we, we improve the infrastructure in, in our community? Or how do we even start small within our, within our school? But the idea of localizing the issues is really important. Local sustainable development goals. And then at times they will relate to the bigger ones and, and come back down again. And the idea is, that it is also important is that we don't necessarily have to, uh, <clears throat> we don't necessarily have to prevent everything. There are these three stages, the first being prevention. But as with climate change, we're not going to prevent it. What we need to do is to uh, learn how to reduce the impact and where we can adapt. This, the adaption is extremely important because the, the mitigation and the adaption will be reflected in the economy of the future. These kinds of sustainability issues are not going to go away wish they were, but in the near future, they're not. So how are we going to build those, those right into the, the very economy of the country? Now, we do have some, uh, some help 
from technology, and we need to be able to learn this. This uh, one on the left is from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and it is a whole series of, of different actions one can take from uh, increasing the uh, uh, the taxes on on gasoline to uh, uh, subsidizing uh, uh, other factors and so on. It, it, you can see there's a whole group of things and you can play with the knobs and see what happens to a temperature increase globally. And uh, what are the different aspects of, of uh, a fossil or carbon base that can be reduced? It's, it's a really neat way of letting students sort of explore figure out their and come to their own conclusions, work on it. And, and then if they do come up with a solution, figure out how would one go about doing that? The one on the, on the right is a, a new um, kind of, uh, uh, it's a word search program that builds on the idea that we are already doing a great deal. It, it, we just don't call it sustainable development or ESD and so on. It's a word search in in, in course outlines and, and in our writings and so on that identify words that align wonderfully with uh, the notion of sustainability. So there, I'm saying there are lots of, of, uh, of things that are out there in the world of technology, it, but at the same time, understanding that we do have to become engaged. There is no simple uh, technological fix that we're, we're aware of yet. And I'd like to sort of close down with the importance of, of higher education. The, um, this is in, in a couple of, of, of different ways. We have Higher education, although globally, it's a small percentage of people that graduate from university, maybe seven or eight percent, and, and but they will become seventy or eighty percent of the people who will largely shape the world, either in, through politics, the private sector, uh, faith-based leaders, all, all in this way. So in the teachings of, of, of universities, we have a responsibility. If we know these are the shapers and we see the problem that is there, we need to do something, right? Even if it's criticizing the concept of sustainable development, it's the best we could come up with in 1987, but what are we? what is better? What can we do, okay? The second thing is through our research. The, the, the UN has identified the, these nine areas that they really want higher education to be involved to do. For, we need much more in the way of further research. And our community service is so important. The whole thing around a, a, a community, you know, how, how can we do that? But also the idea of the university itself, not only in the three core discipline, core areas of service, research, and teaching, but also in what we model, you know, our, our HR, our operations, our purchasing, embedding sustainability right into the DNA of, of our whole institution. And this is this works in synergy. This isn't just about universities contributing. Universities get back the respect, the appreciation, and so on. And it aligns with the core culture of, of universities in, in this way. So the, the whole all of these, the academic values that uh, that are there are reinforced in this in this kind of work. And so the idea then at, at York, where we, we do have the academic plan, where we are trying to embed the sustainable development goals into 
all aspects of what, of, of what we're what we're doing, and schools, all of the the uh, in in uh, southern Ontario, so many of them are in not only uh, looking at the environment through eco schools and so on, but looking at it in this broad sustainability aspect, looking at social justice and many of these other things. So, in closing, let me say. <clears throat> Every every little bit counts. Right? There are there are so much there's so much that that we can do. And I thank you for being with us tonight. And and uh, hopefully you'll stay on for some of the of the uh, the discussion. But uh, we all have handprints, and the thing is to join hands, work together and let's get it done. Thank you. Back to you, Catherine. Thank you so much. I'm uh, busy with a smile um, posting the last uh, link. Uh, I've been accompanying your, your lecture with link and uh, I'm posting the lazy person's uh, guide to saving the world because um, we even the slightest little action sometimes can make a difference. So thank you. Thank you so very, very much um, uh, for sharing your insights and most of our stories tonight. It's always nice to hear first from someone that is actually there. So <laughs> you hear <laughs> That's what comes with age, right? Many, many stories. So actually, no, what happened behind the scenes? Much easier to remember afterwards than um, than just <laughs> reading the documents and and okay. trying uh, trying to memorize everything. So there's a number of questions that uh, that came in, um, and we were also and I want to um, acknowledge um, all the people that also sent questions and before before the lecture, so we could pick some some of the ideas up. And um, here's the first one uh, that Jim uh, shared with us. Um, as we are as we are struggling in translating those huge ideas into our real life experience, like what happens Tuesday at ten? Um, what are concrete ideas in your uh, in your view for schools to address sustainability? And also, when we're looking at the SDGs that, like the quote, go across the departments and don't just address one discipline, but have a much much broader um, broader meaning for for schools and for universities. Mm hmm. Well, I, uh, let me share just some some experience of what I, I've seen. You know, I've uh, I guess it's about eighty countries that I, I've uh, rambled through, and and so with your eyes open, you learn some things. One of the the things is that we need to to take uh, some sort of leadership, either the the principal or the the president whatever we we need to, to, to we are going to do something and then the second thing is, is to find out what is already going on and and to celebrate it say thank you you know and engage those people who are already started in some some sort of uh, of uh, assessment in engaging uh, the simple one we always talked about is the traffic light you know what do we need to stop doing what should we continue doing it's, it's okay with caution modify it and so on and what do we need to start doing and then figuring out from that how how can we develop a plan it's sort of a long a long-term plan and we what kind of resources can can we get for it and it, it's also important to, to hold people accountable some tracking in, in, in the whole thing and engage the students remember it, it's it the whole thing is we're educators it, it, it's about the learning process as uh, as we move forward and slowly we watched as schools went early starting, you know, I have a vegetarian Thursday if they have a, a you know, if, if you have a, a cafeteria or something, but to move from an event, a celebration, uh, sometimes it's clubs and so on, but how do you get this into the DNA? Of, of, of the school uh, over time so that you end up with sort of a, a whole institution approach, whether it's a school, a university or or whatever uh, whatever it is. So those are sort of the key things that, uh, that were, were going on. 
but I think building on people's strengths, it, it, everyone doesn't have to, to, to do everything. You know, some people, their real strengths is, is more in the social sciences. It, it's, it, it's more about engaging people. The things in sports that can be done in, with tag, it, it, uh, being used to show how contagious disease is spread. So the, that's, uh, let me leave it at that. I, I uh, do ramble a kind of. Yeah, no, I, I like the idea of your, it sounds so simple, um, using the traffic light approach. And those are actually also the, the three questions that transforming education asks. Like, what are we going to leave That's behind? True. Yeah. Mm. What are we going to keep, uh, keep doing? And what do we have to rethink? And I think the hardest part at times is what can we really leave behind? Because it means for all of us, maybe yeah. having, having to change a vibe, like everyone has their heart, heart, projects their hard activities when it gets to those everyone else should be giving them up but i'm i'm going to keep keep doing um i think so those those, those keywords strength model whole institution approach i i really like those um a, another question that um comes in is um my heart heart my heart project um the arts um where do you think um the arts can play a role and how do we engage through the arts? What could be the specific role of the arts, which often have the um, the tendency to be crossed out of the curriculum the furthest because we're concentrating on uh, core disciplines. So what's your view on that one? Mm. Thanks for the question. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so important. And, and we have so many uh, teachers that, you know, um, have expertise in, in this area. Some of the things that have moved me the most have been in the way of culture or the arts. I, I, I recall in, uh, in, uh, in Peru, in a small town where they were privatizing water and someone had on a, on a huge uh, wall of a building, they painted it all black and up there, they painted a large tap, a water tap, but coming out of it were dollar dollar coins and everyone knew what that was you know you 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 suddenly get the the imagery uh, uh, there rap songs you know uh, the 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 whole idea of uh, uh, the well one that just struck me also in, in lithuania there was a, a, a big poster that was put up of a Russian tank, but the gun was stealing the Ukraine, it was turned and it was harvesting the Ukrainians' um, wheat, you know. It, it, it is stealing the, the, the wheat with them by the military, those, those kinds of things. I think the, the idea with is. Picking a topic and and having the uh, the students first of all just talk about how they are impacted by either a song, a visual, uh, uh, you know, a sculpture or something, like that. and then trying to to do something themselves, even if it is something as simple as a bumper sticker, you know. But the arts need to be respected and brought to the table in the same way as the social sciences will make it whether we ever bring about the change right every bit as important as the natural sciences we yeah. need to 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 blend together yeah no I, I really like that and and during the sdgs when when we were negotiating the sdgs we were so fighting for the the piece of culture because i the culture is really what 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 makes us human. What really distinguishes us, and I'm, I'm, that's my personal hope that in the post 2030 agenda, yeah. that culture will play a much stronger role. We are getting as you address um, uh, emotions and um, ESD also addresses um, the socio emotional uh, learning. We're getting all kinds of questions um, tonight on the the social and emotional. Uh, learning a learning dimension and um where would you see especially now after the um after the pandemic where would you place the importance of uh, socio-emotional learning also to create those 
compassionate human beings that we're all those better human beings that we're all hoping for oh yeah what a what a what a question yeah the <clears throat> We, we do have to have the facts and the knowledge and, and, and so on, but it's how do we embed that in, in the person and how do we maintain that kind of, of, of uh, engagement with, with the student? Um, this is, is so important. There's a lot of, of very good research and, and um, uh, Catherine, when we send out the links, uh, I would ask people to look into the the documents on on both ESD and the one on global citizenship, but because they're they're very very good at describing the cognitive aspects, the social emotional and the behavioral aspects, and, and just looking at that, and then the teacher can put that into uh, into context the the situation that they're uh, that they're in they you know are, are they working in special education are they in primary are they in university whatever but just seeing that and uh, and adapting that to their own particular situation there's a lot of good work out there mm -hmm. yeah it's um particularly inter interesting because now that unesco has um built on compassion there are a lot of questions of of compassion that we have trouble we, have, we, we can create emotions for family, for people we're familiar with, but it's much harder to create that stranger compassion to really care about the people on the other, like literally often on the other, on their side of the, of the earth and, and building the emotions to, to wanting to do something about what they suffer from or what their issues are, especially the further it goes into the future, it seems to be that compassion goes really down. So I think the emotional learning, and I'm seeing a trend here tonight that many people are, are bringing up the socio-emotional learning, also early childhood. Um, there's even, uh, I have to throw this in, uh, Fernanda, because you're also um, in, in one of our participants today asking about the DNA. There is re more and more research about measuring compassion in brain activity. So there is there is this this new field out there that is um, that is developing. Um, another question that I find uh, very very interesting here that kind of builds on what you've said be before it comes from Katrina, and she's she's asking like how can we make that point of importance in our institutions, and how can we from the from the educator role how we, can we convince everyone in our uh, university or college to to pursue the SDGs holistically and what shouldn't education higher education in particular be held more accountable yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it's hard to hold higher education accountable isn't it you know with with academic freedom and uh very difficult even to call a department meeting uh, but uh yeah it's uh I think uh, with with universities um, with, with the, the rankings, you know, around the, the how much we are contributing to the sustainable development goals, the impact rankings, and so on. Most universities are coming forward and saying, "Oh yes, we're doing this and we're doing this," um, which sets it up uh, for accreditation. Are you really doing it? And so I think uh, that leaders need to start thinking about how are we going to do this and figuring out ways of engaging faculty that wish to become engaged, you know, that, that they can take some, some of, of the leadership. And then from there, uh, work it way back. There will be the next group, of course, uh, who the, the let it happens, and uh, then there will be the small group of no way, and and build on the no ways to to, to respect it and 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 use them to come up with the critique and the critical thinking around sustainable development. You know, sustaining what and, and for whom. You know, all those things that we glossed over so that we could bring it in and work with it but now it's time to really really uh, think about it more but it's in an awful lot of policy and documents and people claiming it so now it's time to hold administration to the fire and it's time for colleagues 
to help administration. We we do need to get this better. It's otherwise we're shortchanging our students, and, yeah. and we're kind of we're fraud. Yeah. <laughs> And it is, is kind of interesting, like I, I can only speak for the greater Toronto area at this point, but there are an awful lot of institutions that do have an SDG strategy from uh, local local NGOs, theaters in, in Toronto, following a whole institution approach, the, the airport, Greater Toronto Airport Authority, all of these. Um, mm -hmm. It's nice to see when the SDGs, you showed the market, uh, the uh, merchandising. It's so nice when the cubes pop up everywhere. Um, building on the ranking, um, Paul had a question tonight, uh, wondering how you feel about the, the competition focus uh, in, in education with, uh, you know, looking at the grades and how do you how do you feel about that hmm. that's where i'm trying to move away from an individual my own achievement i am my own priority towards a more collectively um oriented education system which we terribly terribly need to take more of a responsibility any thoughts on that hmm. yeah well uh, i've always been a, a part of that uh if you look at what the private sector is asking for, they continually talk about people who can work in teams mm -hmm. and, and, and work in, in multicultural teams and in, in, in intergenerational teams and to work in, in, in because almost everything in the real world is not done in a discipline. It, it's done in a phenomenon. It's a situation. And so that's why Finland has really reduced teaching in the way of disciplines, but looking at, at phenomena, what is going on and how, how do you understand it? How do you modify and change it? So the idea of collaboration. On the other hand, we also know that there is competition in the world and and whether you like it or not students themselves intuitively understand where they are mm -hmm. you know there's no matter what we we try to do they're, they're uh, in in any particular discipline at any particular time there are robins and there are crows you know? there are those who 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 are, are doing it. and and the students are aware of it. So, but what we I think that as educators we know that, and and what we need to do is, is to, to address those who are cross in a way that is constructive, compassionate, meaningful, you know, and accept that, and make sure that the whole classroom is is accepting. The other thing about the ratings and rankings, I thought you were going to start with the university rankings and, and, and uh, whether how I felt about that. So I'll just jump in and just say a couple of words. First of all, <clears throat> no, I, I, I think there are other ways of, of, of you know, of comparing and what, what is it that we actually are comparing. But I must say, that this has brought sustainability awareness right to the top and in in the in the sphere of of universities which as i said the disproportionate impact that university graduates have in in, in shaping the world of the future so whatever i'm kind of glad that, that it is there People are, are stepping up and, and, and doing it. The thing will be what happens if your rankings start to, to drop because we have far more uh, uh, universities entering into it. Uh, so how do the universities understand that? And, and are we in it for the long run? And are, can we move beyond playing the game of which targets are we going to go to try and tweak our... And, and look not at the goal, but look at the students. What do we owe them? And how do we embed sustainability across all 17 goals? Yeah. yeah. And building on that uh, question from uh, from Sophia, um, a future future teacher. Thanks students again for joining us. Oh, good. Thanks uh, for being here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
what can we do if we are within those education system? And um, she feels we could change one classroom at a time and create better knowledge and create that sense of, of quality education. Yeah. How, do you, how do you feel? How do you react to that? It's a beautiful question. You know, you're one of 85 million teachers. There are roughly 85 million teachers out there in the world. And if every one of them did something, yeah. think of think of the impact that it would be there. So, uh, you know, when you get into your own classroom, we always, those of us who went in in the beginning, we closed the door and, and, and we, do, we honed our skill, we developed our skill and never forget what it is that you're trying to do in the, in the in the future and develop the skill where you'll be able to radiate to influence others around you by showing what you're doing and watching the re, the the impact coming back from the students you will be a change agent uh, just by doing it and eventually you'll have the skill to articulate what it is that you are doing and to influence beyond that thanks for for the question it, the individual handprint is important. Yeah, eighty-five million teachers, and each each one thirty kids. That's a lot of a lot of handprints. That's there. right. Every year, <laughs> just yeah. just do, do the math. Yes, I, I I hope it also. Um, Ratna um had asked us to create hope for their for uh, for her students or for their students, and uh, joining us from Indonesia um tonight in their morning. Oh, but, uh, yeah. um, <laughs> I want to uh, close because whenever I talk to you, um, I am actually impressed after uh, X number of decades in the field. Um, you're one of the most positive people um, I actually know. And I, I want to close uh, your lecture tonight with um, asking you, what gives you hope and um, why are you hopeful for the future? If, I mean, in light of the current situation, it's so easy to say, oh gosh, everything is terrible. The world's gonna go down. Why are you so hopeful? Yeah. I'm a possibilist. <laughs> it is possible, you know? And if I look back in the nineties where there, 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 there was, basically nothing that was uh, going on and then in in the, the next in the millennium development goals the, the wealthy countries say oh that's for them but now we're in a situation where not only is everyone uh, being engaged countries are volunteering national reports but the top echelon is is saying we're going to do it i honestly believe that at some point a sustainable future will become part of the uh, a, 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 a purpose of education. It will be recognized that way. We're seeing the the rise of school systems building on it. Teachers, all there are honestly millions of teachers around the world who are working on this and and feel really good about it because they know they're they're doing the right thing. And there are NGOs that are so are supplying uh, like uh, learning for a sustainable future for instance right right here in canada in 1991 early in and they're there supplying the kinds of things for beginning teachers and 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 ongoing teachers to be able to do things so i'm not i i am an optimist and uh, i am a possibilist i i think it will be done thank you Thank, thank you so much. And uh, you, you're right. When you chaired the 2014 um, uh, ESD declaration, it was to review the purpose. And now UNESCO in 2021 said sustainability is a purpose of education. Their, their higher education group actually said it. So there <laughs> is proof uh, for you. To, you know, for, uh, there's reason for to doing that. Not so true. 
Thank you so much, Charles. And it was a pleasure uh, uh, talking to you. And uh, again, thanks uh, to everyone for uh, joining us tonight. I deeply apologize. I still have 13 more questions to go and five that we didn't get to. We will try our very best to follow up with uh, with all of you, especially when it comes uh, to our own uh, to our own students um, that we acknowledge uh, that we're, we're here tonight. We are going to pick up the conversation. And um, again, thanks to the team, Aisha and Anderson, for helping to organize and promoting the event tonight. And thanks to all of you for taking this time, taking this time away from your families. So thank you for your uh, to your families and friends um, that were missing out on time with you. And uh, we wish you all the best and we hope to stay in touch. And for those who will celebrate tomorrow, I want to say happy International Women's Day. Thank you again. Thank you, Charles, and have a lovely evening, uh, respectively, Indonesia and Asia. Have a wonderful day. And uh, yeah, see you and uh, hope to chat soon. Thanks. Great. Good night. The world needs more education, sciences, and culture to find sustainable solutions to the challenges of today to build peace, combat climate change, and end extreme poverty, we must focus on innovation, creativity, and new ideas. We need to share knowledge so as to move forward. Every day, UNESCO trains and supports researchers, teachers, journalists, and artists to inform and educate, open our minds, and foster respect. Since 1945, UNESCO has acted as a laboratory of ideas, imagining tomorrow's world, building peace in the minds of men and women. Today, our mission is more relevant than ever. Helping 260 million out-of-school children and young people get an education and teaching skills to nearly 800 million adults worldwide, two-thirds of them women who can neither read nor write. We need to act now to protect human rights and dignity. The United Nations has defined 17 goals to achieve sustainable development by 2030. To succeed, we must invest in the forces that drive sustainable change. Train 70 million new teachers and ensure everybody can receive quality education. Ensure the transmission of heritage to new generations and embrace cultural diversity so that we may understand and respect one another. Defend freedom of expression and access to information. Strengthen scientific cooperation to protect our planet and its ocean. To achieve these pressing goals, we need to build bridges and stronger partnerships with governments, businesses, civil society and citizens. Join us today in turning these goals into reality. Together, let's mobilize our collective intelligence and bring out the best in our shared humanity.